My name is James Bagwell, and I'm uh, conducting this production of Cunning Little Vixen. Good morning, James. Good morning, Kayo. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kayo Iwama, and I am the Associate Director of the Graduate Vocal Arts Program. And the singers of the program will be featured in the opera performance that you'll be hearing on March 4th and 6th. And I'm Doug Fitch, who, and I have the honor of working with these people uh, and directing and designing this production of The Cunning Little Vixen. And I should also mention that in addition to the really talented singers, the Vocal Arts Program, the orchestra for this is the Orchestra Now, which is a fantastic graduate program, uh, and the orchestra is fantastic. It's a real joy to work with them. So, Kyle, I have a question yes. for you. Um, why this piece? What brought this piece to your mm. attention, and why, why this for the Vocal Arts Program? Mm. Well, the Vocal Arts Program at the Bard Conservatory of Music is a very intimate program. We have right now 18 singers, and our philosophy is that in order for the singer to become the complete artist that they need to be, to fulfill their potential, they need individual attention. They need a chance to discover who they truly are as individuals in order to develop their artistic sense and um, their vocal wherewithal. It's a great privilege to be able to be part of a program uh, which is led by uh, the great American mezzo-soprano Stephanie Blythe. Uh, but it is a challenge when we choose repertoire, uh, especially for our main stage opera programs because we want something that will enable the entire program to have something substantial to do on the stage. And uh, so it's always a big search to like, what is that piece gonna be? And up until this year, we've actually done double bills or triple bills in order to fulfill that mission. This year, uh, one of our uh, faculty members, Lucy Fitzgibbon, uh, who's actually also a graduate of the vocal arts program, uh, came up with the idea of Cunning Little Vixen. And as we investigated the piece, it seemed perfect, especially in the time of COVID, because usually the piece is done with children's chorus, but because of the logistical issues that that would um, uh, bring up, we decided to cast those traditionally children's parts with the students of the VAP. And in that way, everyone is on stage for um, a good part of the opera and has all kinds of wonderful challenges on how to embody character. And Doug, our director, has been absolutely marvelous in helping the students find those characters. And Doug, you have a history with this piece. Maybe you could tell us about it and your, how you've adapted your history with this piece to the production here at Bard. I was, well, first of all, I am also excited to say that uh, the very first opera that this program yes. did was one that I also was invited to direct and design. And that was two operas. That was right. the, the Four Saints and Three Acts. Yes. And you conducted it. Yeah. And, uh, and the other one was A Bird in the Ear. Right, by David by Bruce. David Bruce. Yeah, right. It was a world premiere, world premiere. And it was our very, very first opera production with the Vocal Arts Program back in 2008. 2008. Yeah. Well, so, uh, so I have a history with the program. Yeah. <laughs> the history so with, great to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> the, the history with my history with the cunning little vixens was from 2011, yeah, 2011, with the New York Philharmonic, and I was uh, working with uh, some truly great singers and uh, the New York Philharmonic, and we had to, uh, created a, a, a production that would fit on their stage with their orchestra included in, in the production, uh, and it was such a treat to discover this music, this. Um, it's so rich and so deep as a symphonic score, and so intelligent, the, mm -hmm. the characters and the characterizations, and uh, so 
it, I have all this music in my head that never went away <laughs> since 2011. <laughs> and it's just great to be able to uh, bring it back to life and, 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 um, and find new ways to embody these characters. Of course, there's a gigantic difference of not having the symphony orchestra sitting on the stage. Uh, so we had to fill up some of the space <laughs> with other things and other ideas. With a set. With a set. <laughs> and also, um, I remember when the question of, yes, we could get a children's choir, but then it was just like, that's going to be so difficult just to organize and in, these in these unprecedented times. And so we, I just said, well, let's just do it with puppets. Yeah. And that's been fun too. I mean, yes. there's a sense of, there's a, there's a kind of logic about using puppets and not using puppets. And I think we've erased all logic and reason because <laughs> we just have some characters are puppets and some characters are people. Mm -hmm. And some people are insects and some are porcupines mm -hmm. and some are humans. And that's just the way it is. Yes. <laughs> and somehow Jana checks music can Bridge brings life. us into that. Yeah. yeah, it bridges that, the reality and the sense of proportion because the characterizations are so deft and expressive. And the, a lot of the characterizations are in the orchestra. That's right. Yeah, that's what I mean. And, and yeah. when, we were, when we were rehearsing uh, some of our initial rehearsals with the orchestra, um, you know, we kept finding these little moments where, I don't know if it, the audience will even hear these moments or mm. not because they're so tiny, they're just sort of meant for us. Yeah. Oh. And oh, the, yeah. the, score is, the score is, um, I think, pretty wildly complex, oh, but, so you know, it can't sound that way. That's you right. Know, it has to sound, it has to unfold and tell the story, which Janacek does with such a great rhythmic acuity and also, these orchestrations are just extraordinary, yeah. just fantastic music in every La way. The, the landscape of sound in, in the in the overture, which is very short, but it's still this incredible overture. It just sets you into this mood of being in a forest and yes. things just lurking, and, and you know your eye moves because the squirrel's tail has just gone over there, and then <laughs> it's just then all musical landscape. Yes. I, yesterday, I was I was hearing the con Colenio. Yo, Colenio, yeah, yeah. Do, 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 do. And it's just. It really has yeah, that power. It, it sounds like it sounds like somebody walking over dry sticks. Yep. In the like the <clears throat> winter setting I'm, we're looking at right now, which you all can't see, but we're looking out um, the Fisher <laughs> Center at this fantastic landscape of snow and trees and sort of brittle air. Yeah. And in many ways, the opera opens that way. I wanted to tell you two nights ago, <clears throat> I went out and uh, on my porch to breathe some fresh air, <laughs> and it was twelve o'clock or something, you know, mm -hmm. coming home, mm -hmm. after, and maybe 11, it was dark. And mm -hmm. uh, I suddenly heard this rustle, and I thought it was maybe rain falling off the rain or something. And it wasn't, it got closer and closer, and it was a badger. <gasps> a badger, we have a badger in the show. Yeah, the ba there's a badger. And I've never seen a badger in my life, and it came <gasps> right up to me, like six feet away, and was looking at me. And I think he was like saying, so how's the sh show going? <laughs> 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 it was like the most natural thing. And then there were three deer, a family of deer, a doe, and it was beautiful. Well, you know what? I was driving home last week, and a fox crossed my path right on my street. Was it a fox or a vixen? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get that close. <laughs> no. yeah, yeah. So As you can tell, we've been in the theater for a while. <laughs> and um, we've become absorbed with this world that... Uh, yeah. That, that Doug, you've created a really quite beautiful world. And maybe you could talk about some of the design oh, sure. elements of that as well. Uh, when I designed this originally in 2011, the costumes first were, the, were a major part of it because mm -hmm. the set was, the set was two thirds the New York Philharmonic, mm -hmm. but there was other, and a bunch of sunflowers. Um, uh, but the, the, yeah, I was, I was living, uh, as I still am, in Brooklyn. <laughs> and at that time, surrounded, just was watching, around, you know, as I kind of tend to do, just people <laughs> and what they're wearing and what... I knew that we had a good budget, but not an enormous budget. And I figured, well, wouldn't it be interesting if I could just sort of take people off the street and turn them into animals? And instead of anthropomorphizing the animals, and, and in a sense, I was animalizing, you know, human clothing. And, mm. and so I saw bike helmets and little backpacks and I thought these children in my neighborhood and they're wearing baggy cargo shorts and pants and things. And I 
I said, wow, those cargo shorts, they just look like haunches. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if I get the right colors and baseball shirts, these you know, raglan sleeves, they look like foxes when they've got the right colors with a white chest. And it was just like, maybe I can just use ordinary things. Uh, the bike helmets enabled me to make insects because they have an exoskeleton. Mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and those little down vests that people wear, they look like thoraxes. Yeah. So I, I just played with this stuff and then all this, uh, the, the rules were no fur, no fake fur. Mm -hmm. You have to fake it in new ways. No camouflage patterning and no, uh, you know, no real uh, anything. So I had um, lots of uh, artificial uh, plants and things like insects were having giant, giant banana leaves for their insect wings and things like that. It was really fun to work on. Well, I love the beetle, the back <laughs> the of the beetle, which is, which is made of a garbage, a plastic garbage can, yes. and it's cut up in various ways. And then the helmet uh, it also uses pieces of that with some artificial ferns sticking out. Yeah. Well, that's your creative imagination, Doug, like these things that erupt out of your brain, but then they, you manifest them right in front of our eyes with your hands. <laughs> I think it's so miraculous. and. It's the perfect, it's the perfect artistic sensibility for this show. So we're really so fortunate to yeah. have you back with us. Oh, well, that's do it. a mutual feeling. I really am very, I love this place. This is one of my favorite theaters. Well, we're excited to bring this to the community. And uh, I should also mention that some of the performers are also members of the undergraduate uh, voice program that we just started at the conservatory. Yeah. Uh, we, so it's a yeah. real mix of, of people. There's mm -hmm. some graduate conducting students involved in mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a real uh, community event. Yeah, opera takes a lot of forces. It does. Sure it does. Yeah. It's a very complicated, we were just talking about this, uh, how we're gonna do our rehearsal today, because yesterday we had our first rehearsal with orchestra and singers, it's called a Zitzprobe, which means that the singers sit on the stage, the orchestra's down in the pit, and the singers have an opportunity to get used to it. And today's rehearsal, is something called an orchestra tech, in which they will begin to add all the staging it back in, getting a, a sense of the flow, and also that helps everybody, yeah. people who are backstage, people who are doing the lighting design, where the costumes and the whole thing, they get a sense of how this flows, and the more that can happen, uh, the easier it is at the end of the process when they really are doing this and in a real performance setting with the audience. Yeah, everything that every person is doing behind the scenes and on stage or in the orchestra pit serves the vision. But sometimes the vision has to be tweaked <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> in order to accommodate the practicalities of the, you know, the, the, the needs. We have some really interesting gender swaps in this yes. piece that I'm very happy about. So yes. we'll, find, we'll just leave that to, to, to you. Yeah, yeah, come and discover that. <laughs> There's a lot of swaps going on and a lot of things going on backstage. So people who were once a chicken are now becoming frogs and people who were had various different animals are becoming humans backstage. Yeah. And it's, so there's a lot of switching and swapping. It's so fantastic though, because the students, the singers get to discover ways to embody a human being yeah. versus an animal and, or a different kind of animal. And that use of the body as expression has so much to do with also how they use their body to sing and mm -hmm. produce sound and how they use their body to form words and be expressive. So it's an emotional, physical, musical connection. And you've done some wonderful work in uh, chicken coaching, I think. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> you I make had a, a great chicken. Yes. I had a pet chicken once. Yeah. Well, you know, so did Janacek that he uh, had his chickens in his farmyard. And he was right. a, obviously a nature lover, but he um, kept them as pets and named yeah, them. Yeah, they're, they're pretty fantastic. Yeah. I mean, our, our, frog too. the one that I had lived in, in, in the house with us. And, and, oh, in the house? Yeah, and uh, Chicken Diane, her name was. <laughs> <laughs> but she- That's very close to Chicken Devon somehow. Yes, I know. <laughs> It was, she didn't really know, but she, she was, I mean, as soon as we gave, you know, the, that kind of total freedom, uh -huh. 
to this animal, which she was not expecting because I got her from a, one of those live kill poultry places or something, uh, for a performance. Uh, 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 she um, just, as soon as she w sensed like that human connection, mm -hmm. she was just so happy and would be with us all the time. She'd jump up on your lap. She would. She knew when you were coming wow. home, she would run to the door and jump up and down. And she just liked to be with us, sit on your shoulder. I would take her in a basket shopping. And it was extraordinary. And then when we said, OK, we can't keep doing this. This is a lot of cleaning up after. <laughs> so we built her a chicken co-op. We thought that was better than All a chicken right. coop. <laughs> so we uh, put her outside on, the, uh, on, the, on this deck. And, and she didn't forgive us. It was different. <gasps> she couldn't. She couldn't she couldn't quite get there. Oh my gosh, that resonates so yeah. in interesting ways with the story of the opera. It totally does. Yeah, my it goodness. It's absolutely the story. Well, that, that, I mean, that's one of the things that Janacek is exploring all the time yeah. about the relationship between animals and each other within the animal mm -hmm. world, humans <laughs> and each other in the human world, and then humans and animals yeah. and what they learn from each other. There's this very specific line that the um, Vixen says about what she's learned from the humans. And then in the final act, the forester tells us, pours out his heart of what he's learned what he's from learned. nature. Mm -hmm. It's also <clears throat> useful to say that uh, Janacek based it on this comic strip. Yes, which yes. Had, that's right. I think yeah. all of these interactions in, in, embedded in it mm -hmm. as well. And it was brought to his attention by his cook or something. His housekeeper. Yeah, his housekeeper, yeah. right. Yeah. And the reason that happened is because he just kept hearing, hearing, hearing her laugh in the, in the kitchen. He said, what is all this? What are you doing? What is, what's so funny? And I think that's just such a great idea that that's, that was the initial impulse for the opera. Yeah. Go to where the laughter is, this random sound. And it's your housekeeper, and she's reading this comics. And it's like, that's a good opera. Yeah. Really. In fact, I think she said that to him. Like, yeah. wouldn't this make a great opera? And there's a line. In the opera, yes. it says, "Be careful! They're gonna they're gonna make operas out of you." That's right, right. and yeah. put no, you in the right. funny pages. In the funny pages, yeah, yeah. so great. Well, the it was an interesting point in Janáček's life. He was seventy years old. He <clears> had <throat> already written operas with, <clears throat> uh, with very dark themes. Yeah, but he was newly in love. He left his wife of many many years. She was a kind of severe difficult woman. He was no picnic either. <laughs> no, he was not. <laughs> According to the, the things I've been reading about his relationship with conductors, this was not... Uh, <laughs> right, it's not an easy it man. It was not uh, roses and yeah. sunshine all the time. But he fell in love with a, a, a very young woman. Uh, so I think she was still... Teringa, Teringa. Yeah. Oh. And it was like that. that. It was like that. <clears throat> and uh, so he... You know, when you first fall in love, it transforms everything that you see. Everything becomes beautiful and alive. And you know, your Hopeful. hormones coursing through your body, it's like drugs. So uh, it's all poured, all that love is poured into the music, I think. And this, for us, and for me, has been a very healing experience post-pandemic and also currently as we are dealing with um, these terrible s situations in the world. Um, it's such a gift to be able to be in this space sharing this music, these values. And together. we hope to see you all there as well. Yeah, uh, please come share with share us. Share with us and uh, just to be able to, the simple task of unmasking and singing and people seeing each other's faces on the stage. Those little simple things are um, so, so important as we relate to one another and we relate to the audience.